So, so far in the course, we have been looking at how one agent uh, solves problems in some given domains. So, we are talking about autonomous agents and they do certain kind, they have a problem to solve and they try various search methods to solve problems. Now, we shift our attention a little bit to a world which is a little bit more complex in which in the sense that there is not just one agent, but there may be other agents also. And that is a very common situation and uh, it has been studied by various kinds of people uh, including economists and computer scientists and mathematicians. And our focus will be very narrow, we will only look at a particular kind of games. But in general, the idea of games has been there for a while. So, let us look at uh, uh, some definitions of what do we mean by game theory essentially. So, game theory is a theoretical framework for conceiving social situations amongst competing players. So, typical games have adversaries essentially, though game theory is even applied to situations where there may be co cooperation. We will see that there are different kinds of games that one can model in social situations. In some respects, the game theory is a science of strategy or at least the optimal decision making of independent and competing actors in a strategic setting. So, whenever we study game theory, we assume that the players involved or the agents involved are perfectly rational essentially. And then we try to analyze that if, if, if all the players are perfectly rational, and by rational we also mean self interested that they have their only their self interest in mind. They want to maximize their own gains essentially. Then what would happen in any situation in which there are multiple players. So, the key pioneers of game theory were the mathematicians John von Neumann and John Nash as well as the economist Oscar Morgenstern essentially. There was a film uh, called A Beautiful Mind made uh, on John Nash which uh, if you have the time you could have a look at that. So, what is game theory again? The focus of game theory is a game which serves as a model of interactive situation amongst rational players. So, we basically say that we model this situation as a game essentially. The key to game theory is that one of the, the one player's payoffs and we use the term payoff when we talk about game theory as to what is the gain that you make as a consequence of the decisions that you are making is contingent on the strategy implemented by the other player. So, in game theory, you are not acting alone, there are other people also acting. So, what will be the payoff for your actions is also determined by what other people's actions are essentially. That is what makes games quite interesting. The game identifies the player's identities, preferences and available strategies and how these strategies affect the outcome. So, when we model a situation as a game, we have to identify who are the players, what do they want, which is their preferences and what decisions are accessible to them or what strategies are accessis accessible to them and then how does the whole thing, what happens, what is the final outcome. Depending on the model, various other requirements of assumptions may be necessary. So, we will see various different kinds of games and eventually we will focus down to simpler games which are games like chess, which is what we want to learn how to program. So, it is assumed that players within the game are rational and will strive to maximize their payoff. So, that is the basic assumption that they are rational agents and they want to maximize their own payoffs essentially. Each agent has the same goal essentially, the same general goal. Now, there is something called the Nash equilibrium named after John Nash and it says that it is the outcome which reached that once achieved, no player can increase their payoff by changing decisions unilaterally. So, every game has a, or most games have a Nash equilibrium. Uh, maybe I will give you an example later of a game which does not have a Nash equilibrium, but uh, most games have a Nash equilibrium and if a Nash equilibrium is reached, it means that no player can uh, improve their payoff by unilaterally making some decisions. It can also be thought of as a no, no regrets uh, uh, situation in the sense that once a decision is made, 
the player will have no regrets concerning decisions considering the consequences because the player knows that this is the best that the player can achieve and we will see a nice example as we go along. So, another definition of game theory this time from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy is the study of ways in which interacting choices of economic agents produce outcomes with the respect of the preferences or utilities also is a term that we use of those agents where the outcome in question might have been intended by none of the agents. So, this is an in interesting point in this new definition that the outcome that finally comes will be intended by none of the agents and we will see the famous example of prisoner's dilemma uh, where this happens. So, a group whose members pursue rational self interest. So, remember again we keep emphasizing this that agents have rational self interest. They have self interest and they are good reasoners or they are perfect reasoners may all end up worse than even though they have self interest then they may end up worse than a group whose members act contrary to rational self interest. And it can be seen in many situations that uh, uh, that the outcome of many many games is worse than what could have been if there was cooperation. So, when we say rational self interest we basically mean lack of cooperation, lack of collaboration between people that each is acting independently to do their own thing essentially. So, if you look at the situation in uh, uh, Europe for example, uh, where uh, Russia has attacked Ukraine, but all the western allies the European Union and the NATO and they are acting in their rational self interest. They know that they if they get into the uh, war then they will suffer greater uh, damage or losses because uh, there is also the danger of it escalating into a nuclear conflict essentially. So, if you look at what they are doing they are acting in their self interest that they are trying to say that okay, we want to help Ukraine we want to do this and so they are supplying arms sometimes uh, surreptitiously and clandestinely but they are not jumping into the fray essentially and that is why you can see that the outcome of this behavior of all the countries involved is that the war has been continuing and escalated for the last 6 7 months when i record this thing there are other situations where rational self interest may end up in a situation which is worse so typically if you look at the indian political scenario at this moment of time uh, there are many smaller parties which want to come together to fight uh, elections together, but their rational self interest prevents them from cooperating because each of them for example, want their candidate to be the prime minister. It is another example of a game situation where they are acting rationally, but they are acting rationally only from their self interest point of view not from the overall interest let us say of the country. So, here is a classic example which which shows that self interest does not always lead to the best outcome and that is known as the prisoner's dilemma. It is a standard example of a game analyzed by in game theory. So, remember game theory is a field essentially started by von Neumann and others and we study situations uh, and the economists uh, in particular are very interested in game theory because a lot of economic decisions involved kind of game theory we will see examples that show that two complete. So, this prisoner's dilemma it shows that two completely rational individuals might not cooperate that is what I have been trying to highlight even if it appears that it is in their best interest to do so and the example will make it clear it is a very nice game uh, this thing. It was originally framed by Merrill Flood and Melvin Drescher while working in Rand Corporation in 1950. Albert Tucker formalized the game with the prison sentence reward. So, he introduced this notion of prison sentences. Remember that every agent is talking about payoff and they are trying to maximize their payoffs. Sometimes we use the word rewards, but sometimes it can be penalty also. So, the payoff is a more general term and he, he gave the name prisoner's dilemma. So, what is the game? There are two members of a criminal gang they are arrested and imprisoned separately into separate cells, they are being interrogated separately. Each prisoner is given the opportunity either to betray the other 
by testifying that the other committed the crime or to cooperate with the other by remaining silent essentially. Okay. So, there are two options each player has that to betray their accomplice if you want to call that person or to cooperate. With. So, cooperation basically means that both of them deny that they have done the crime. Betrayal means that uh, they agree and then of course, a deal is offered to them essentially. So, the offer is as follows. If A and B each betray the other, each of them serves two years in prison. This is, a, this is what they are told individually by the people who are interrogating them. That if you betray the other, you will get two years, you will be let off with two years. If A betrays B, but B remains silent, then A will be set free. So, in fact, this is what is told to them. They say that if you betray the other person, you have a chance of being set free essentially. And then B will serve a longer sentence of 3 years essentially and vice versa. If B betrays A and A does not betray B, then one of them will benefit, the other one will get a harsher sentence. And finally, if they both remain silent, then they both will learn uh, serve a 1 year sentence in prison on some lesser charge because the police is not able to prove that they have done this. So, there are 3 cases remember. When they each betray the other, they will get 2 years each. If A betrays B and B remains silent, A will be set free, but we, B will serve 3 years. And if both remain silent, then both will get 1 year essentially. So, if you look at, think of this problem before we analyze it a little bit more uh, carefully, you can see that the best that they can do is to remain silent because then both will get one year, one year and if you kind of add it up then the total sentence they get is two years essentially. If both betray each, each other they will get two years, two years that means four years in all essentially and if one betrays the other and the other does not then the total sentence will be three years which is also more than what they would do if they were cooperating essentially. So, the best outcome for them is to get one year each, which is sometimes called as a Pareto optimal. But we can now model this situation in this fashion essentially. So, there is a payoff matrix and uh, this on the column the choices are for A, on the row the choices are for B. And essentially if they both cooperate, we have seen that it will be minus 1 and minus 1 for them essentially. So, that means one year sentence each. If A cooperates and B defects, then you can see that A gets minus 3 and B gets 0 essentially. Likewise, if A defects and B cooperates, then A gets 0 and B gets minus 3. And if both defect in the sense that both confess, then both will get minus 2 minus 2 exactly. So, some people have characterized this into four kinds of uh, rewards which are shown on the top right R, R, S, T and P, P. What are these? R is the reward if both cooperate that is you can see is minus 1 minus 1. P is the punishment if both do not that is in the bottom right corner which is minus 2 minus 2. T is the temptation to betray in which case you hope to get let off easily which is 0 and the reward is 0 and S is the sucker punch that you do not uh, betray, but your accomplice betrays then you get this minus 3 essentially. And it has been shown that as long as T is greater than R and R is greater than P and P is greater than S, then both players will end up defecting essentially, even if the game is repeated many times. So, what happens when both defect? They get minus 2 minus 2 essentially. So, let us see how why that happens, so what is the rationale behind this. So, we have the payoff matrix on the on the top right and we look at it from let us say one player's perspective and he thinks that his accomplice that is, so he stands for accomplice here. So, if he defects what should you do? So, each of those two will think in this pattern. What if the other guy defects? What should I do? Then you can see that uh, 
if you defect you will get minus 2 and if you cooperate you will get minus 3. So, he is defecting meaning he is conf confessing in that situation you should also confess that because then you will get minus 2 and uh, otherwise if you do not confess you will get minus 3 and he will be let off with 0 essentially. So, in that case you should defect essentially. So, that is what is shown here that that is the right decision. What if he cooperates? Then it turns out that again if you defect you will get be let off with 0. If you cooperate then both of you will get minus 1. So, 0 is better than minus 1. So, again the rational thing to do is to defect essentially. So, of course, the other player will think in an identical manner. So, both will end up defecting and so that is where the Nash equilibrium will be in the case of this prisoner's dilemma essentially. They each will end up serving 2 years whereas, they could have end escaped by serving 1 year if they had cooperated and not confessed essentially. So, this shows that uh, rational self interest can result in outcomes which are worse than if they had been able to cooperate essentially.